Lost the element of surprise and not receiving air support by the Pakistan Air Force, the Pakistani armor was thrown into absolute chaos. By noon, the tally stood in favor of the Indian Air Force, with 12 tanks destroyed. In the periods of relative calm, when the Indian Air Force was not overhead, the tanks surrounding the post were ordered to pull back to the south of the post, around 51 Brigade. By now, the Indian Army's reinforcements had arrived and were in the process of deploying themselves. When uh, Sangha came, he told me, he is briefing, Sir, enemy has now stopped all movements. Then he briefed me about the complete details and in fact he drew a small sketch. He says, this is the places where tanks are burning, the pillar of smoke coming up in the battlefield from these uh, tanks. All these tanks are burning, but there are some more tanks still intact in that area, which I couldn't see. And he told me that next sortie is coming at one point. I took off at about 12.35, went to Longewala and oriented myself to the complete battle situation. I saw all those tanks which pillars of smoke were coming out. On the enemy side, all movement was frozen. Now in my anxiety to find more tanks, which Sangha had told me are uh, intact, from Longriwala post, which were fought most troops, I raised my heights. And keeping that road on the right, that Kharotar and Longriwala road, I flew exactly about four to five minutes onto the enemy side, which could mean about seven, eight, ten kilometers into the enemy side. We started observing on the right. Suddenly I found smoke puff from two places. There were seven tanks in that particular sand dunes and that bowl. They were nicely tucked in. So I came back and started flying over Longevala post, waiting for the hunters. And I looked around, the, on, the, on the skyline I could see two hunters running. I immediately said, I said, please come forward in the same line. I am waiting for you. So in no time, they followed that road, went in front of me, and then I guided them onto the east end. In the next two hours, seven more tanks were added to the tally. A message from the Pakistani tank commander desperately calling for air support was intercepted. Unfortunately, no such help was coming. By the evening, the total stood at 19 tanks destroyed. At the end of the day of the 5th, there was, we couldn't really claim an accurate number of tanks, but there was a number of them burning on the effort and it appeared that they had very few left unless there were reinforcements over the, over the night. During daylight, the odds were in favor of the Indian Air Force. Anything moving on the ground was attacked with devastating results. With nightfall, the enemy had all the advantages. The regrouped tanks could either retreat or forge ahead with the initial game plan. If they decided on the latter course of action, Jaisalmer Air Base was at great risk. The night proved uneventful for the Indian Air Force. For the Pakistani Army, things were different. Having taken heavy casualties during the day, the commander of 51 Brigade and the rest of the Pakistani forces were on the verge of mutiny. Orders to press on into Indian territory and capture their objective were ignored and the Brigade commander was considering a retreat. Morning found the tanks still milling around in confusion. This was just what the Indian Air Force needed. They took the gift with both hands. 
Under the pressure of the constant and accurate attack by the Indian Air Force, the Pakistani forces gave in to their frustrations. By sundown, the Indian Air Force had added to their existing score. The total now stood at 24 tanks destroyed, along with assorted vehicles and troop carriers. Strictly speaking, I think the battle of Longewala finished on the 6th itself. At the end of the day, the uh, army asked us to do a recce onto the western part of the border, which we had not done before, and from which the tanks appeared to come, to see whether there was any reinforcement build up in that area. We spent the whole evening sp patrolling the border and inside Pakistan but there seemed to be no movements that we could spot. When we returned to Longewala before going back to base, we found that the tanks had already withdrawn from the post along the track on which they had arrived and had bedded down for the night. But it was too dark to attack them. We returned to base and landed. And from there on, on the 7th and 8th, it was a question of just chasing these tanks back towards Pakistan, which most of the operations taking place on the border at a place called Border Post 638. Relief for the detachment came the next day when 12 more hunters arrived at Jaisalmer. On landing, the pilots were given a quick briefing while the aircraft were refueled and armed. Without wasting a moment, these pilots were on their way to engage the retreating tanks. Initially, I must say that the Pakistani tank commanders were very, very aggressive and brave. They opened fire whenever the aircraft came into an attack. They were moved their tanks very aggressively on the ground. But for us, that movement was not far enough to disturb our sighting system. There are many pictures of their tracks on the, on the sand out there and that tells you how they were maneuvering, but it didn't really come in the way of our sighting. As the day progressed and as hours went by and they started losing more and more tanks, they became extremely, I think their morale, they lost their morale. After that, if you attacked a tank, they kept the hull down, they did not fire, they just stayed as targets. It was sad to see, in one way, the breakdown of morale that took place into that force. Having confronted and dealt with the immediate threat, the pilots of the 122 squadron were now at a loose end with no targets. There was a lull now in Jaisalmer with no enemies to attack. It was one of those, we had many pilots, many aircraft and very little now and very little work to do. We still patrol the railway line and road, attacked any army or military train that was passing on the road, refraining from attacking any passenger, civilian passenger. If there is a target that you've got to attack, which is a military type target, for example, there's a military type target, could even be a train carrying military stores on um, a railway line and you need to attack it. Now the best way to stop that train is to attack the engine and we know that the, there's an engine driver there and maybe more. You don't think of it, the, the engine is a target to be hit and you aim to hit it and then if you can destroy Whatever military stores are on that train, you've done your job. Initially in the war, on that same railway line, there used to be some passenger trains running on the fourth. Why Pakistan permitted passenger trains to travel on that railway line on the fourth after war had started, 
was a surprise to us, but we never attacked a civilian train. Um, by the fact nobody was there to guide us or to tell us not to do it or to do it, but I think the Indian Air Force has got a sense of integrity and uh, the country's got a very high model uh, values, holds held by model values, and out of that came the decision never to attack a civilian target. Why this tactical masterpiece was not supported by Pakistan's air power still remains a mystery. Speculations run rife as to the result of this battle had there been a coordinated effort between the two wings of Pakistan's armed forces. Looking back at I can tell you that if they had sent two fighters, they would have taken on hunters and their tanks would have had a field day on the ground because we had nothing to defend against that. Our guns, artillery, they were still moving from Kishangarh side and they reached sometime on the fifth afternoon where they deployed in support of the ground troops. They were already in the rear division, rear areas of a division strung out on one single road who had was having great difficulty in trying to reverse its uh, self. If they had air cover and sufficient air cover, they, we could not attack them. We would be attacking their air and their air would be attacking us. And therefore they would be free from any attack in the air. If they had air support, I think it would have been a very different situation. Today, more than three decades later, a few of these brave guardians of our skies are no longer with us in person, and those who walk among us are in the autumn of their lives. Few would notice anything distinguishing about these hand-picked veterans who rose to and above the call of duty and ensured the borders of our nation were secure. We sleep in peace, knowing they have passed the torch to younger blood, who are bathed in the same ethos of duty before self. We, the nation, salute these unsung heroes of yesteryear.